Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. to 
All I can think of is Bullwinkle and Ronky. Button up my sleeves, presto. Some of the weirdest things come into my head before I do a message. Uh, yeah, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Uh, well, we are, we are in interesting times, and uh, I, I, I love it because I always, I always am trusting God, and uh, it's just uh, one of those things. So we're still in our series. I'm looking for First Corinthians, right there. First Corinthians 19, we're going to go there. So you might as well put your finger in the Bible. If you have one in front of you, um, I think there's a First Corinthians. No, there's not a First Corinthians 19. No. Well, we won't go there then. <laughs> and we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out where we're going. But, uh, Father, just be with us tonight, Lord, as we continue in this series, Father. Lord Jesus, just allow us to have an understanding of your word, Lord, if we can find out where this verse is I'm looking for. But, Father, thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace, Father. Thank you that we don't have to be perfect. We just have to be obedient. Father, that's all it is. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord. Open the eyes and ears of our hearts. In your precious name we pray, Father. Amen. So, the Word of God says that my body is a temple, all right? It's a temple of the Holy Spirit. Um, again, we can't look at 1 Corinthians 19 because it doesn't say that. But the Word of God says that it is, and on top of that, it's not our own. So, our, our body is a temple, but it's not our own. It belongs to Christ. It was bought and paid for with the blood of Christ, so what are we supposed to do? All right, now, I've been reading Deuteronomy 28. It's uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. 6, 19 through 20. There we go. Let's go there then. Thank you, Ray. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. All right. I know what I did. My fingers get so fast sometimes that I forget to put what I'm supposed to put in there. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 says this. Here we go. All right. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. I'm, I'm on verse 18. I'm starting there. Is those who are perishing, but is the power of God to us who are being saved. For it is written... I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will set aside the intelligence of the intelligent. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the teacher? No, which one? 619? All right, let me go. I'll get this right tonight at some point in time. Uh, there we go. It's just one of those nights. Okay, we're going to start at verse 18. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God, you are not your own. For you were bought at a price, so glorify God with your body. Now, if you go to Deuteronomy 28, and, and I love that because Deuteronomy 28 is Moses telling the Israelites what they have to do. And if they do it correctly, they will be blessed. But if they don't do it correctly, they will be cursed, basically. Now, you know, it's kind of interesting because, you know, again, the Word of God says our body is not our own, all right? It belongs to God. And, and you know, it's like, it's like loaning your car to somebody, and it comes back in bits and pieces rather than a whole car. See, because somebody doesn't take care of it. So if we've received Christ, again, out, we, we, we basically said, I'm handing my body over to you. I'm handing my life over to you. And, and 
we still have possession of it. And he says, but you should live in my will and way. And if you live in my will and way, this is what happens. But if you don't, this is what happens. All right. Now, you also got to remember this. The word of God says this. For those of you that want to live in the law, and I have a few friends that love to live in the law of the Old Testament. Of course, again, we know that God came and fulfilled the law, and he said the most two important commandments was love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. We, we know that's what they, that he said. All right, so with that being said, if you break one law, you've broken all of them. And so I'm not going to live by the law. I'm going to live by the commandments of Christ, which he says... Love the Lord your God with all your heart, <coughs> mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Quit trying to find out. Quit trying to find out what's wrong with your neighbor when all you got to do is look in the mirror and figure out what's wrong with you. See? Because again, we ha we're too quick to do this. I'm, I'm pointing off to the left here. We're too, too quick to do that. We're not too quick to wake up, go and look in the mirror in the morning and go, man, like Paul said, I'm the worst sinner of them all. See? God, please be with me this morning because you know I'm going to screw up. You know I am because I get stupid and, you know. And so, you, you, you know, just fix me. Fix me. David used to have his heart checked. He said, Lord, check my heart every day. Check my heart. You know, I'll make sure I'm in good standing, right standing with you. See? So again, what are we supposed to do? Glorify God in our body and in the human spirit. By what? Revealing who he is in our lives. Right? Revealing who he is in our lives. Now, you know, it's kind of interesting because, you know, there's a lot. I sat there and listened to some youth pastor last night while we were eating dinner. And he threw all his youth kids under the bus. This one's doing this. This one's doing that. And, and he's saying it loud enough so that I can hear it, and I'm in the next booth. Actually, he was saying it loud enough so the whole restaurant could hear it. And I'm like going, are you kidding me? Dude, look in a mirror. Because I bet you're everything you're saying these kids are. See? Look at yourself. You know? And, and I kept hearing him say, I, I, I. Uh, please spare me. I was a youth pastor for 30 years. I know how not to act and how to act. So again, we're supposed to glorify God in our body and in the human spirit. Again, if we look at Proverbs 6.32, the word of God says this, he who commits adultery lacks understanding. All right? He who commits adultery lacks understanding. Now, again, I don't want to look at this in the sexual connotation. I want to look at it in the other connotation, which is, which is this. Because the word adultery in the Greek is the word nahaf. And nahaf means adulterous worship. So it's when idolatry is when we worship something before God. All right, so it doesn't have to necessarily mean the sexual connotation, even though that's what it's talking about in this. But as I look at this, and I broke down this word, it was like this. It's idolatrous worship. When we, are, when we, when we if we're married, look at another woman and idolize her, we are committing an idolatrous act. When we look at anything and we put it before God in the will and the way of the Lord, then we are committing an idolatrous act. Idolous. An idolatrous act. Now, what does this do to the body? Okay, here's what it does. Again, it creates a wound. It creates a wound. You know, how many people go on the Internet and they're cruising for chicks? And they're looking for somebody that... Oh, I'm going to find the perfect woman or man on the Internet. Are you high? Because first of all, that's not who you're talking to. You're probably talking to some old man sitting in his underwear at the kitchen table, passing himself off as a 17-year-old girl. Come on. Come on. That's not who God has for you. 
all right? The world, matter of fact, the Bible says, the world is full of snares. <coughs> Satan sets snares. Oh, God, help me find the perfect woman. Oh, I know. I'm going to find her on hookup.com. Or I'm going to find her on wonderfulwomentomary.com. No, that's not it. See? And, and what happens? We start cruising those sites instead of, well, maybe watching this tonight. We're cruising those sites. Or, you know, we could be reading the Word of God, but no, we're cruising those sites. And all of a sudden, it's one in the morning, and we're still cruising those sites. See? How many married men do that? Oh, I just want something exciting. Well, you know what? You're the key to excitement in your marriage. If you're not going to be exciting, you're going to, you know, it just is the way it is. So there's a wound. And that wound, because of dishonoring the temple, brings us to a place of not understanding and having a proper relationship with our spouse. And we wonder why marriage in the church is down to 48%. See? We wonder why all these young men look at women and women give up what God has given them for their husband. All of a sudden, this is happening. And, and the enemy's laughing because he's shaking the pillar, one of the foundational truths, and the sanctity of marriage in the church. See? Creates a wound. And that wound brings dishonor to the temple. See? Why does it affect our relationship? Because of the dishonor associated with the wound. And I love this because, thankfully, repentance is always right there. Because the, the Word of God says, cast your cares upon me, come before me, repent of your sins. And I will make you new. I will restore you. I will restore you. So, so again, repentance and redemption bring in healing. Which brings in transformation as well as deliverance. See? You know, the enemy's always looking for a way to bring distraction through distortion. All right, so here's, here's the thing. You know, and, and I love this because, you know, you sit down and you talk with people and say, oh, there's nothing wrong with looking. Yeah, you, you're letting it into your head. And then you're fantasizing about it. And then you're idol, you're worshiping it. And in your worshiping of it, what happens? That becomes the focus. And the focus is taking, taken off God. And the Lord says, wait. Come back to me. Come back to me. I, I, can, I, can, I can transform you. You just, have to ask, you just have to ask for forgiveness. Come back. Repent of that. I'll restore you. I'll bring you back to this place. We'll get the healing process going. We'll heal that wound, and we'll bring the relationship back to the place that it was supposed to be. That's, that's what it's all about. See? Through transformation. So again, the enemy is always looking for a way to bring distraction through distortion you know how? By using other people that do not have the same defined understanding that God created marriage as an illustration of our relationship with Christ. Oh, that old ball and chain. I got to lug her around everywhere. Come on. Come on. Come on. Don't let the enemy bring in a distraction to interfere you from, to, to distract you from living a complete marriage that he created to reveal the purpose of a relationship with Christ. You know, if Jesus had Facebook, relationship status, complicated, 
Because that's what you said. So my relationship status is complicated. No, if you went before a pastor and you got married and you got married and you did your vows unto God, it's not complicated. Unless you make it complicated, unless you let the enemy in to distract you and redefine God's sanctified marriage to something disgusting instead of the beautiful thing that it's supposed to be. I know there's many people that are listening to this today, and they're not liking what I'm saying. But you know what? That's the truth. That's the truth. This is why marriages in Christian circles are all bollywhacked. They're all screwed up. Because the enemies come in and said, oh, put it on your status. It's complicated because it, the only reason it's complicated is because the enemy's complicating it, and you're letting him. My gosh. You know, it's funny. I don't talk much about when I was a kid. Sometimes I do. It's not because I don't remember. It's because I really don't want to talk about it. Because, man. But I remember this. <coughs> I remember my father used to come home. And you know, I love it when people say, oh, I just need a drink to take off the edge. I, I need a drink, too, to take off the edge. It's usually water. It takes off the edge. But you know what really takes off the edge? This takes off the edge. I know I can always go to God and drink of the water of life. See? My, my wife and I were trying to get in this this habit of reading this book every night before we go to bed. It's called Mr. and Mrs. And we're trying to read this thing, and usually Crystal's falling asleep on the couch. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> we, get, we get so caught up in doing the things that we do before we go to bed, and then all of a sudden Crystal goes, the book. And I go, oh, yeah. Trying to get in the swing. You see, that's what you need to do. See, you have to... You have to you have to create habits, not bad habits, good habits. See? So again, I remember when my father used to come home, have a drink, take the edge off. Pretty soon that one became two and the two three. Pretty soon it was something else and something else. And you know what it did to my parents' marriage? It destroyed it. You know, I, you know what's funny? I'm going to tell you this. A pastor told him exactly what Deuteronomy 28 said. If you do this, you will be blessed. But if you don't, you'll be cursed. You know? And, and we wonder why. God, why are you doing this to me? If you read his book, if you read his instruction manual, if you read the roadmap to life from God Almighty, you will find that he, none of the punches are pulled if you do this. This will be what you have. But if you do this, <laughs> well, I mean, you look at the Israelites. He, Moses blatantly told them, here's what God has said. If you do this, this is what happen. Jesus said the same thing, by the way. If you follow this, you will be prosperous. Now, again, not prosperous as in the Benjamins floating out of the sky, driving a big Bentley and all the rest of that ridiculous garbage. Prosperous as in you will be ready for the next part of your journey. How many people, after last night's voting thing, are now standing there going, Oh my God, what's going to happen? Well, I know what's going to happen. God's going to sit on the throne. He's going to, he's going to have everything in the palm of his right hand. And he's going to say, My plan. And I'm not going to freak out. See? Because I know God. It is so important to understand warfare. And warfare is in marriages as well as everyday life. And warfare on marriages is even harder than warfare on just an everyday basis. You know why? Because it's a pillar. It is a sanctified pillar from God. And I'm going to tell you something. 
The enemy wants the house to crumble. So again, put on the full armor of God. Oh, oh, but Pastor Mark, it's, it's going to crimp my fun. I'm not going to be able to do the things that I do. We shouldn't be doing the things that you do. Especially if they don't glorify the temple or reveal God in the temple. Oh, but Pastor Mark, I like going out to the clubs. And <laughs> Does it reveal God? Are you out there saving people? I doubt it. I bet you're not. And you wonder why everything's going downhill at an amazing pace. Because your body's not your own. It's a temple. And it belongs to God. He paid the price for it. So we have to wear, excuse me, the full armor of God, not just pieces. Not just pieces. Oh, well, Pastor Mark, I'll put the helmet on today. I don't need the rest of it because, you know, I'm just going to. You need the whole thing every day. Most of you, I hope, put on underwear. Put on the armor. Most of you put on socks. Put on the armor. Most of you put on pants and shirts. Put on the armor. Put on the armor of God. See? And watch what happens when all of a sudden the enemy can't get into your thoughts. He can't get in and say, it's complicated. It really isn't. If you follow the illustration of marriage in the Bible, I, I think of Song of Solomon. You know, I love Song of Solomon. Oh, her breasts were all this and all that. Oh, her, she was lovely. You want to learn what marriage is about? You go, you and the Song of Solomon. Because Solomon. that's what it's all about. And you know what? That sets the tone and the illustration for how your life should be with Christ. I love Lamentations 3, 23 through, or 22 through 23. It says this. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I've been married to Crystal for 32 years. All right. Have we agreed on absolutely everything? Uh-uh. But the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases for me, so the steadfast love of Pastor Mark never ceases for Crystal, even when we don't agree with something. I, I don't change my status on Facebook. It's complicated because we disagreed on something. No, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Well, that's it. I don't agree with you. I'm leaving. I'm going home to my mother. I'm going, or, you know, when a man says he's leaving, somebody ought to come along and he goes, no. He goes, oh, I love them. It's going to take a lot more than that to stop me from loving them. I'm going to keep pouring out mercies. It's never going to come to an end. I'm always going to be ready to say, oh, thank you for coming back. Oh, I love you. And you know what? Tomorrow's a new day. My mercies will be new every day. Because great is my faithfulness. When we live in that thought every day, and, I, you know, this is, again, if you just took this one message out of this whole series, and you applied this one message to your marriage today, tonight, watch what happens. Watch what happens. When we live in the thought, this thought, every day, meaning nothing is held over, we start fresh. I love it. Because my grandmother said, don't you ever go to bed mad? And I think we've only gone to, to bed once mad. Never, ever, ever. Even if we've got to stay up all night and talk it out and hash it out. It doesn't matter. That's what we're going to do. Because you know what? Again, my grandmother says, never let the sun set on anger. So you know what? Live in Lamentations 3, 23 through 22 through 23. See? 
when we live in that thought every day, meaning nothing is held over, we start fresh. You know, how many of you, how many of you believe that you need a renewing every day? See? We need a renewing every day. My, my prayer, my hope is that you go before God every day and you say, Lord, today's a brand new day. Yesterday's behind me. Boy, was that a mess up. It was complicated. And today is a brand new day. And Lord, I just want to rest upon you and I want you to lead me in my marriage. How many of you will do that? Or how many of you are going to say, oh, that guy up there with the hair and the funny goatee preaching about marriage, he doesn't have an idea. He doesn't know. He doesn't know what was going on in my life. Yes, I do. Not because I know, but because yes, I do. Yes, I do. I do know. And I, knew that the, and I know that the enemy loves distraction. And he gets in up here. And he gets in through here. And he gets in through there. Let's see. Every day, we need a renewing. Get off the hookup site, single people, if you're watching. Get off those sites that say, this is the perfect match for you. Because the word of God says, don't be unequally yoked. See? And you know, there's a lot of people that lie about being Christians. I'm sorry, but there's a ton of them. You know? And they're usually looking for money. Oh, if you send me 250 bucks, I'll, I'll come to where you live. No, they won't. Because it's some 70-year-old guy on the phone or on the computer holding up some young, young girl's face. Renew your relationship with the Lord. Get off the hookup sites. Renew your relationship with God. Live in 1 Corinthians 7, 8. Having a love relationship with the Lord in the purest way. That way, all those needs will be fulfilled. All those needs will be fulfilled. Say, quit looking in the garbage Quit looking in the garbage for the whole cheesecake. Because all you're going to find is the remnants of what somebody else chewed up and spit out. Let that be an illustration for you. See, you don't want that. You want the best. And believe it or not, God will bring the best when you become the best in him. Father, we thank you for this message, Lord. We thank you for your guidance, Lord. We thank you for your path. We thank you for your righteousness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your mercies, Father. There may be people tonight that have never received Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you something. That's an easy thing to do. Um, it's just bowing your head and closing your eyes and saying, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord, for living the way that I did which is totally against you, Father, for, for idolizing these things and putting them before you. And Lord, that was not right. So Father, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, forgive me. Come into my heart. Lord, my heart is ready to receive you. I am, I am just coming before you, Lord, and I'm saying, Father, forgive me. Come into my heart and save me. Save me from, save me from all this ridiculousness. See? From all this ridiculousness that's going on. I need to put you first, Lord. You need to be first. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Transform me, Lord. Transform me. Take me out of the pattern of living that I was in. And help me to find a new pattern, a new habit. And that habit consists of putting you first. Putting you first. Lord Jesus, transform me and sanctify me. In other words, reveal your plan to me. I'll tell you what, Deuteronomy 28 tells you what happens if you do and if you don't. Quite plainly, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Now, if you said that prayer, I would love to hear from you. I'd, I'd love to have you message me um, because I just want to pray with you. That's the first thing. And then maybe, you know, you can come to the church here and, and see this all in person which is quite interesting sometimes. But I'll tell you, we have a breakfast this Saturday at 9 o'clock. We'd love to invite you. The food is amazing. Um, it's free, all right? 
and, and you can partake, partake in the food and partake in the fellowship. And, you know, this, if you've got any questions, we're all here to answer them. And, and that's just the way it is. See, help, let us help you build the foundation that the Lord calls us to build based on Deuteronomy 28. All right? Father, we thank you, love you, and praise you for this message, Lord Jesus. Father, help us to swallow it, chew it, digest it, Father, and get every single bit of it that we can out of it. We thank you, Father. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Have a great night, everybody.